Let's uh, welcome George. George is here. And uh, as I was putting this together, George, I, I realized that every time that I've ever heard you introduced, it goes something like this. Well, George is here. This is a man who needs no introduction. And so he never gets an introduction. And I realized that we have no idea where you were born. We have no idea where you went to school. We have no idea where you went to college. We don't know what degree you hold. And it all doesn't make any difference. So it just proves that most of the time these introductions are pretty useless anyways, right? So here's right. the man who needs no introduction, George Fenton, who um, is going to talk about how they make a center handle server. Good morning, everybody. And uh, it's good to be here. Oh, Fine. wait. You have to get one of these. I have one? OK, is that, that working now? Yes. All right. My father used to tell about stories about Fenton Luck and um, a variety of things that he would include in that situation. And I feel like that I'm um, experiencing a little bit of Fenton Luck this morning. And the reason that is is because I had this talk on the schedule for 1.30 tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> okay? And I decided this morning that I ought to come over and do a little research and look at the film and take some notes and things of that nature so that I was ready tomorrow to give the talk. And I come in and sit down and say, well, you're on in five minutes. I'm lucky, and you are lucky, that I'm here. Uh, because otherwise, I would not have been here at all. Um, so we're going to talk about the uh, center handle servers. Uh, they're a very unique piece, a very difficult piece to make. Uh, what I think we'll do, first of all, is to go through the video and narrate that, uh, where it shows them actually being making, made. Then we'll take apart the mold and, to, and look at that a little bit, uh, and then open it up for questions uh, so that you can understand about that. Um, it is a two-part mold. Uh, the top is what I call a shell mold. That's this part right here. It's a round, solid um, receptacle for the glass. You drop the glass in there and you press the glass out. It then goes through a hole in the bottom down into a lower mold uh, that is the handle mold. It doesn't have handles on it. Uh, it would normally have wooden handles on it at the bottom. So you can open it up and get the handle out. Uh, because as you'll see, when you have the glass coming down, uh, you take apart uh, the handle, otherwise there's no way to get the piece out of the mold. Um, we make bells this way. Uh, you make the top part in the shell mold so there are no joint marks in the bowl portion, uh, although there will be joint marks basically from that bowl mold, uh, portion uh, down. And you can make different handles using the same mold if you had a another handle mold. Uh, because you can make it fit. So you could make dolphins or uh, a variety of different handles if you just change the bottom mold. Uh, so that's one of the flexibilities uh, of this design. Um, so let's, uh, let's start. Um, this is uh, when we actually made some pieces, I think, um, for the Stretch Class Society. Uh, we're watching, this is Jim Reynolds is the pressure, presser. Uh, who's working the press. Uh, the guy in the background is the gatherer. He's going to um, gather a uh, gob of glass uh, out of the furnace by turning the uh, punty, which has got a ball on the end of it, uh, brings it out, drops the glass in. We didn't get to see it actually cut off, but they have to be get it um, the right amount of glass. They're struggling here for the first time to try and get the handle in the special snap to hold it. Uh, while they're then going to reheat uh, in a glory hole, uh, which is a temperature probably around uh, 1800 to 2000 degrees, maybe a little hotter, uh, to get the top uh, molten and soft. 
Uh, they're turning it all the time so it doesn't run out of shape. Dave Fetty is the uh, supervisor there, uh, working with him. He was a great finisher and a uh, great skilled glass worker, as you know, guys I'm sure know, um, and a great person to work with in many ways. So they're bringing the glass out to the sprayer. Uh, he's going to spray a tin oxide spray on the outside and then the inside. And when that spray is, uh, the piece is then reheated and changed shape, the spray will actually uh, separate and cause the stretch finish. Um, that's the difference between stretch and carnival is then when in carnival you spray it after the piece is in the final shape. In stretch you spray it before the piece changes shape. Uh, so that's where you get the stretch finish. Um, so he's going to be uh, warming it in, watching it. He can tell from how it moves and the color when it's ready to come out. Uh, bring it to the finisher. Um, Dave is then sat down in the chair, so he's going to work out some of the uh, process. Um, we didn't have a sample on the shop uh, that Dave Chatler tells me, and so they weren't exactly sure how much to roll it back. Uh, rolling it back means turning the edges up uh, towards the handle. Uh, Frank is on the shop, my father, uh, to uh, help them with shape and uh, design and ideas from that standpoint. Uh, then they're going to take it out of the snap uh, and carry it into the um, annealing layer, which is probably around 1100 degrees and will slowly cool the piece down uh, to room temperature to take the stress out of the piece. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, again, they're having a little bit of difficulty getting it out. This is typical when you do something new. Uh, it might take, if you're lucky, it might take a half an hour to start getting pieces that are good. Uh, it could take several days. You can see here the inside of the snap uh, that forms the uh, around the dolphin handle so that it doesn't crack uh, and it holds the piece uh, in a solid way so it's not shaking when you put it down on the finisher's bench for the finisher to um, roll the piece back. And it has to, you know, that's made separately in the mold shop the way the mold itself would have been made. Uh, he's using a cherry wood paddle uh, to turn that back, it doesn't mark the glass and it uh, um, has good smoothness so that uh, you can turn it up. You can, if you could see the piece up close at this point, you will be able to see the stretch uh, finish here. You can see various colors as well as the roughness that will come along uh, with the stretch finish. In uh, these cases, the handle will not be iridized. Um, you can see when he sprayed it originally, uh, the handle was covered by the snap, so it didn't get any iridescence. Um, there might have been some that leaked into the size of the snap. Uh, you might be able to see that on a couple of pieces, uh, but generally you wouldn't have any iridescence on the snap or on the on the handle. They're going to now do whimsies, which are different shapes, and they're talking about. Uh, what kind of things they might be able to do uh, for the whimsies. So he's doing one uh, which I guess is here on the table uh, where the sides are turned up. Um, and again you can see where the, the, uh, the handle's not iridized but the rest of the piece is. When I asked uh, Nancy if she had any, Nancy's my wife who worked at the factory for 30 years and, and uh, was head of design, um, if she remembered anything about this particular piece, um, she said Frank told her that it was very difficult to anneal. The stresses that you have inside the piece, um, you need to get, cool that glass down so that what happens, the outside cools, the inside's still hot. As the inside cools, it shrinks and puts pressure on the outside. And so in this particular shape, uh, when you turn it inside out, uh, the stresses are sort of backwards. 
And it was very difficult to get these whimsies annealed, and I understand that most of them ended up in two pieces uh, at the end of the uh, Lear. Uh, again, because they're going through more treatments, you know, changing the different shapes. Um, I also remember a time when we were traveling on a, onto some uh, signing events in Texas, and uh, we had a little bit of extra time, so we stopped at a small shop uh, in the middle of Texas. And I went in, and we met the shop owner, and I signed some pieces for them. And uh, so we had one of the uh, blue um, opalescent, I think it was, stretch uh, pieces that we made recently. And I signed the first one, and it cracked immediately, completely across. And uh, I signed the second one, and it cracked immediately, completely across. So I've learned not to sign those anymore. Um, it was a very uh, unpleasant experience. Um, so they're you know putting on a crest here, um, smoothing it out so that it's even, um, and then they'll reheat that and finish it. Uh, typically, you would crimp those because um, it helps to hide any unevenness in the um, in the ring. Again, they're bringing it over and spraying it, and that chills the piece as well. Uh, so you've got to get it re-hot or hot again, and keeping the handle hot so that the heat in the handle is balanced with the heat in the bowl is one of the problems that you have from a you know from a kneeling standpoint. Because you'll notice that that handle, once it's in that snap, it never gets heated again. In hindsight, they should have probably put it on a burner or a glazer and reheated the handle before they annealed them. They probably would have had a lot more survive if they'd done that. Because one of the thickest parts of the piece is the base right at the bottom of the handle. So it would have stayed hotter, and it would have seen heat from the glory hole. So it would have been hotter, and right beside, and it would have been right beside the handle, the top of the handle, which would be cold. And that's a no-no uh, when you're trying to get it properly annealed. You can do, you know, all kinds of different shapes. Um, this reminds me also of the six-piece of pern that we bought them all from LG Wright that we made in Burmese, and also a green opalescent that had little um, fingers protrusion off the off the bowl. And when you turn that, those things were like you just touch them and they come off. You have to they're very difficult to. And very, very delicate piece, but beautiful piece. One of the prettiest ones, I think. While we're watching the whimsies, are there any questions at this point? Okay, we're one more review. So he put some. Um, wax on the mold to lubricate it and to cool it. Uh, you saw him cut the glass this time. He's pulling a lever and which pulls a plunger down. Um, we'll see the plunger later into the middle. Uh, it pushes the glass down through the hole in the bottom again. You can see the handles on the bottom of the, uh, of the piece. Uh, he's going to open up the handle mold, uh, pull it out the shell, and then dump it. See how it drops right through there? Okay. Um, again, he lubricates it because that part right down there in the bottom will get the hottest that sees the glass. Uh, he's when he uh, cuts the glass, he's got to get the right amount. Too much, it'll overflow the mold. Too little, it'll uh, be too thin or it won't fill the mold out. Uh, when he uses his pincher or his shears, he has a little stamp on the other side. It's just flat, but he's smoothing out the joint mark uh, so that it won't create. Um, what you know, called a joint mark on the bottom of the piece. That guy's called a catch out. Uh, that's a pretty uh, descriptive name, and he's got a, a pretty strong arm to be able to catch that amount of glass. So bringing it over again, snapping it up. Um, you've got to get the glass hot in order for the iridescent spray to take. 
if it's too cold, it'll turn out silver and it won't be a good iridescence. You use the spray booth there because that particular spray is a caustic uh, solution. Um, you can see the fire of the uh, paddle burning. And we weren't turning them um, again. We weren't turning them back as far as the older ones were turned back. Uh, they would normally sit on the ring in the middle. Um, I'm guessing that we probably had some that came away that were the bottoms, what we call were rocky bottoms. They didn't sit flat, and we might have actually ground some uh, on a wheel to make them flat. And they're carrying them over and putting them in the annealing layer. Uh, which again starts at about 1100 degrees, takes on this piece, uh, they're, typically it's two hours for a thicker piece, like an animal, it could be four hours. Uh, they probably should have put this one on a four hour layer instead of a two hour layer. Okay, so that's the, that's the, uh, the film. Let's take the mold apart. Okay, this is the plunger. Um, uh, let's see, get over here. I don't want to hold that up away from me. But you can see it has uh, this part is attached to the press. Uh, this smooth part is what comes down inside the, the press or in the mold in order to press the glass out into the outside. Uh, it's got a little uh, nipple on the front of it. Uh, which reduces the weight that's in the uh, in the bottom of the handle uh, to make it set up faster. Um, this is called the ring. Um, it uh, stops, it creates the top of the piece uh, so the glass comes up inside the mold uh, to this uh, ring. Uh, you can have scallop rings you can have a variety of different things built into the ring if you need to. Uh, when I put it down on the mold, you can see uh, that it comes, the glass comes up, and this is around the, uh, uh, the mold. Um, this is the shell mold. Um, okay, you got the hole in the, in the bottom. It's uh, perfectly round um, and fits, you know, the plunger fits down into that. Um, then you have, uh, this is a locking key that goes in and turns this way, which locks the mold shut. Uh, you take it out, and then using these handles, you open up uh, the handle mold. Uh, there are several things about this that are of interest. One, of course, you see the dolphin um, figure down there, and the glass goes down inside that. You can see these holes that are all the way around the handle. Uh, those are drilled in the mold in order to reduce the weight uh, or of, of metal around it in order to get the metal that's just close to the handle hotter. Um, the more metal you have, it uh, takes longer to heat up. So by reducing the amount of metal that's around by drilling those holes in the mold, you get that part of the mold to run hotter uh, than otherwise, and if it runs too cold, uh, the glass uh, will crack uh, when it goes in. It won't flow properly. Uh, if it gets too hot, the glass will actually stick. So the mold has to be somewhere in the 800 to 900 degrees in order for the glass to be properly formed and best formed. If it's too cold, again, it'll crack. If it's too hot, it'll stick. And you really don't want it to stick, because then it takes a while to get it cleaned off. Um, and then there's a bottom plate on the bottom here, uh, and all this fits together. They'll uh, be, they will preheat uh, the mold before they start in an oven, uh, bring it over to the press and put it on the press, 
and then start putting glass in it, which keeps it uh, hot. And, uh, and then this is the snap. It's a spring-loaded snap, which you push, push down in order to open it. Uh, and you put the glass in. Um, and you, as you saw on the, uh, on the video, they, it just snaps back together again. And then you can work with it. Uh, going through the process. Do they, do they coat those snaps with anything? I see some of them have some, like a white. It's a lime solution um, that keeps them from marking the the glass. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. How did they know how much glass to put in this mold when they didn't have too much glass? It's, it's a practice and experience and skill. Uh, so. You know, they might do the first one and have too much. They might do the second one and have too little. Uh, and it's a team process because the gatherer has to gather the right amount of glass to bring it to the presser. So it's pretty close. And then the presser will cut. But the other thing that is, is uh, important in the process is that when you look at the way the ring and the plunger fit together, there's actually a flat side of the plunger he down at the bottom, almost flat, meaning almost vertical, right down in this area, so that if there's a little more glass, the plunger will not go down as far, and yet it'll still close the top of the mold off. Uh, if there's too much glass, it'll you know it'll work up a little bit. So there is a room for the size or the weight of the piece to vary. They don't have to be exactly right, but they have to be close. So there's room, there's a sort of a self-adjustment process or design built into the mold. So some of the pieces might be heavier than others. Um, and that difference is the thickness of the bowl um, is what, uh, what will happen differently uh, if, the, uh, if they gather a little bit or a little bit less. Um, class. John? Would that also affect the pin diameter? Um, yes, it could a little bit. Could it? Thickness maybe more, uh, but diameter also could affect it a little bit. Um, and uh, it also could affect, I mean, the hotter it, or the thicker it is, it may just stretch out a little bit more. It may be a little hotter as they go through the process. You also mentioned that it may not fill all the way up yes. on occasion because we've seen some of the hard glass where they're missing the saute bits. I don't know if you've seen some where it didn't look like it came all the way up into the ring. That's possible. Um, normally those would get thrown away, but 100 years ago some of them didn't get thrown away. They got sold. <laughs> yeah. They could also have been, in the reheating process, they could have been melted off. That's another possibility. Uh, but if that would normally happen all the way around the piece, not on one side. So. When you pour the glass into the mold, approximately how long do you open the container of the mold up? Well, you saw them there, uh, it was just a couple of seconds. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't, uh, on a piece like this, uh, which doesn't have real, you know, it, it's going to set up pretty quickly. Um, I mean, he would, he waited, you know, you're going to set the piece, meaning pull the lever, and you're going to set the piece with pressure. Um, so that's going to set it up. Uh, and then it was, I, I'm trying to remember back to the video. Less than five seconds, two or three maybe. Mm -hmm. if they don't take it out right away. It sticks, correct? It can, yes. It'll it can shrink on the plunger, and stick, um, or it could get too hot and stick. Okay. Uh, the building solution is different from structure the carnival. Yes. Um, I mean, there depends on the uh, the carnival glass. Um, that we used more recently um, was, you know, was a titanium base. Uh, this is a tin base. 
Um, marigold is a tin and an iron combination, and some of the one, the old carnival, was also a tin and iron combination. So the question, yeah. The question was, what happens if it comes out of the furnace and cracks before you spray it? Can you reuse the glass? And the answer is yes. Uh, you can you can save it, break it up into smaller chunks, and then remelt it. Um, typically, we would remelt in the 15 to 20 percent of the glass would be remelted, uh, in and that increased uh, as we got more cognizant of energy costs as they went up. Okay, quantity in the marketplace depends basically on two things. Uh, was it attractive and was it easy to make? Okay, if it was easy to make, uh, then there's, and it's sold, then there'd be a lot of them. <coughs> if it were ugly and hard to make, there'd be none of them, or very few, okay? Um, although some ugly things sold. So, <laughs> um, so I'm guessing if there were more diamond optic ones, the marketplace wanted more diamond optic ones, and we made more diamond optic ones. Um, and the diamond optic, um, where you would get that from, you would have another plunger that could be used with the same mold, and that diamond optic pattern would be cut in the plunger. Uh, so this is a plain one but the, the diamond optic would be on a separate mold. So you could switch back and forth. If you had two plungers, you could make diamond optic one day and plain ones the next day and continue through the process. And my guess is it was the marketplace that dictated that because I don't see a significant difference in difficulty of making diamond versus plain. They would have been basically the same. Cal? Right. Um, was it just the period of time when you were making these that, again, those colors were out of favor with the market? Or is there, that would be my that would be my a, explanation of it. Yes. Not more difficult to make them in ruby, or more difficult to make them in. Well, ruby would be tough to get the color right, but it would be interesting. Yeah. Okay, so you would have it would be ruby amberina. Some areas the handle might be amber, and the rest of it might be red. Uh, which I think would be attractive. Uh, so I don't know that it's it's. Uh, and there are some glasses that are what they call harder. They set up faster, um, and some that are softer. Opalescent colors tend to be softer. Um, so that, but I don't know that that would make a difference in this case. So you think this was probably market? Yep, I think it would be market and t as you say, timing. They were making this particular piece while they were making these particular colors and you know it's it is totally a judgment and personal preference of the decision maker as to what you put in the line at any particular time uh, so you know it also could be that they didn't sell well you know and so yeah price could make a difference and uh, Yeah, so 
So these would have been more expensive pieces than typical, I would think. You know, as the in the initial marketing process. Okay. Uh, you mentioned there's a possible solution to the problem with the handle, uh, cooling the spring uh, brakes, etc. Uh, a burner or a blazer is a possible solution. What what what's that process? I'm not familiar with the with the process. I don't. And where would it have been used? I'm thinking that if when they turned the piece out of the snap before they carried it in, there would be a burner or two. Um, and a glazer is a machine that typically has a rotating spindle. Uh, so you can put the piece in the fire and it rotates around so that it's evenly heated. No, it's a separate piece of equipment. You know, it could sit on a table or it normally would sit on a stand with, with open flames, yes. And so you would put that in there, uh, heat it up a little bit before you carry it into the furnace. Where, or the where would that, on, on other pieces, where would that have been? On what kind of pieces would that have been used for? Oh, there were lots of pieces that that would be used from. Um, and uh, so in some cases, it would be to smooth the edges. Um, you know, figurines, for example, would all be glazed, um, almost all glazed before they would go in. We got a lot into that a lot more in the... Uh, Probably from the middle 80s on, we have many more glazers that we were using in, in order to improve the polish of the product. I think if you were to look at our product later and earlier, you would see a difference in the, in the polish of the piece because we were using glazers a lot more. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we all know glass companies copied each other constantly. Whatever was selling was... Um, right. Who made these first? Was it Benton or Westmoreland? <laughs> I don't know. I'm who made them first? Uh, who made the the, the, the center dolphin, the dolphin yeah. um, trays first? Fenton, Northwood, whoever. Well, the uh, handle servers uh, were, were made actually prior and even after the stretch period. So center handle servers were. Mm. That, that but the, I'm specifically asking the Dolphin X. Uh, for the Dolphin uh, Cal, you're a Dolphin X for us. Are any other handle servers with a Dolphin handle? Yeah, Westmoreland had, had that. Westmoreland made it. Westmoreland, Westmoreland had one uh, much later. Yeah, was, was it much later? Yeah, that, that, that was much later. You're the you're the expert and the historian. I'm not the. They come they come much later. Do they? Not during the stretch. Okay. Well, no, no, not not stretch, not stretch. I'm just saying the the type, the item itself. Well, yeah. So there's there's Westmoreland Tipton, I think, also made a dolphin center handle server. No, yeah. But again, many many. Yeah, I, I think I think you folks had the monopoly on the, the <laughs> dolphin center handle servers for for a long time. Mm -hmm. and apparently, based on the number of that we find surviving, um, you know, they either had very high rates of breakage, or they were expensive pieces that you didn't make a lot of because the market probably couldn't stand you know, did, didn't Couldn't respond the to the price point. Yep. I mean, these, these are, like you said, they're expensive pieces to make. They must have been expensive pieces when you were making them during the stretch period. Even when you made the one for us, uh, when Frank priced it for us, it, it probably is, even to this day, the most expensive souvenir that we ever had made. And I'm sure he gave us, you know, a very good price for it, probably a lot less than you would have charged oh, don't, in don't, a retail. Oh, don't believe that. Don't believe <laughs> that? Okay. <laughs> well, maybe he didn't give us a very good price, but... Yeah, they didn't call him Frank and Bill James for, you know... Okay. All right. Well, I won't go that far then. <laughs> yeah. They, they are an entertaining item, you know, that's, uh, you know, they are functional, they're, 
you know, with fruit or crackers or cheese or, you know, they're very good for that. So, you know, her point was that might have been the upper, uh, more, more wealthy people who were going to have it from a functional standpoint as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> uh, I've also wanted Amberina. Yes. Um, how often did you do Amberina on purpose versus how often was it just, uh, I'm going to say, a bad job, not what you really desired? Well, there was certainly a mixture because there were definitely times when we were making things that um, we wanted to be red all over and they turned out to be Amberina. <coughs> but, in most cases, it's driven by the shape of the piece. What, what you need to do in order to get the ruby color is you need to press the piece or blow it, cool it down, and then reheat it. Because the materials that are in the glass are what's called a striking glass, which means the color develops as you work it. Um, and so if you take, for example, a goblet and you press uh, the goblet, the stem will be frozen and never reheated. So it will be amber when the top and the bottom, and we actually, in goblets, we will use the glazer. We'll heat the top, and then we'll heat the bottom in order to strike the color. Um, you can make a ruby batch that strikes very dark and strikes very easily, um, and we would do that uh, on things like very small pieces, cup plates, to get a red glass that you know, comes out of the furnace that way. But if you bring it out with that easy striking on something that you finish, it's going to turn black or brown on the edges. So I think we had like seven different ruby batches with different amounts of colorants in them in order to get the range of things that we had fairly consistent. So if you put the pieces of glass on the table, they would look the same, but they may have come out of four or five different batches because of their shapes. Um, and then there were kind there were times when we wanted it to be Amberina and we specifically worked for that. Making it a little harder to strike. I mean, is there can you put a twenty five seventy five that you want to do? Oh, I would think we were ninety ten trying to make them Ruby. Yeah. Rather than Ruby Amberina. Yeah. And and it's one of the one of the I think things that I've learned is that many times it's the collector groups who have named the colors. And we may have been making the same color, but it turned out to be three different colors in the collector group. Well, that's more where the kind of question came from that I think that was particularly early on when they didn't call it Amber. You couldn't make it consistently all the time because every, you know, every piece might come out a little bit different. Thicker, thinner would make a difference in terms of color. How long the guy warmed it in would make a difference in terms of color. Uh, whether the first person dropped it and the next person got through the process faster would make a difference in the color. If he had to wait for the person in front of him, could make a difference in the color. So all of those things are very slight variations that could that could create the kind of variations that you see uh, in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. uh, we still have those. Um, we, we sold the archives to the Corning Glass Museum, uh, somewhere around 300 bankers boxes worth uh, of archives went to them uh, about a year and a half ago. But we still have a pallet full of, uh, of the um, glass maker's notes. Um, we haven't gone through them. It would take a long time to go through them and sort them in a way that would be understandable and useful. Um, but we haven't decided uh, to part with those yet. I'm not sure we will on that. Anything else? All right, thank you. All right. Thank you.